Hello and welcome back to the third lecture on probabilistic machine learning this term. Today we are going to begin to move forward towards real applications of probabilistic reasoning that you might even call a very basic and elementary form of machine learning. We are um, here in the course, we've done lecture one and two in which we found out that probabilities are a way to distribute truth over, not in a binary way, but in a continuous way over a space of hypotheses, we learned that this uh, way of distributing truths recovers um, certain common sense aspects of our reasoning in our daily lives. We also saw that doing so uh, drastically complicates the computational processes of inference beyond those of propositional logic, because we now have to keep track of a potentially combinatorially large space of hypotheses. We saw in lecture two that one way to simplify these reasoning processes is that probabilities can be independent or probabilities over variables can be independent or conditionally independent of each other and when we find such conditional independent structure inference can become drastically cheaper than combinatorially hard. Today we will do two things. We will um, first complete our mathematical machinery so that we can then actually uh, uh, finally have a license to talk about probabilities on all sorts of interesting variables and then we'll do an example, an extended example, to really see how inference works in re vaguely realistic applications. That first part, fixing our um, machinery, consists of two things that I've so far left out and haven't talked about so much, or actually haven't talked about at all in the previous lectures, which is that um, the way I've introduced probabilities makes it hard to talk about certain kinds of variables, continuous variables and derived variables. We will start with the derived variables. So just to remind you again of our definition of uh, probabilities, this, they rest on essentially the notion of sets so to define probabilities, we take a space of elementary events um, and then define a collection of so-called measurable sets on them. We call this collection the sigma algebra. These, um, this is a collection of sets which has the property that it, is, that it includes both the entire space and the empty set and it is closed under intersection, union and differences of sets. This just makes sure that we talk about sets, um, that we talk about a collection of sets in which we are allowed all the operations we would like to do. We can think about joining, intersecting, and separating from each other uh, sets that we think about. To define probabilities, we take these to be a function, P, which maps from the elements of the sigma algebra onto the, v the real numbers, such that all empty sets are assigned probability zero, the entire set is assigned a probability of 1 and everything in between naturally has to have a probability between 0 and 1 because of our th um, third or in this case the second axiom which is really like the master idea of uh, probabilities which is so-called sigma additivity which says that um, the probability of unions of disjoint sets is assigned a probability that is equal to the sum of the individual probabilities of these disjoint sets. This axiom ensures that we are not inventing truth out of thin air when we combine sets with each other and also that we do not lose truth into thin air when we take intersections or unions of, um, of uh, sets. Now, um, this is all nice and well, and in all the examples we've had so far, the process of inference that I showed you was that I define this elementary, a set of elementary events, this measurable space or Borel space that consists of this elementary set and the sigma algebra, and then assign probabilities to every element of omega, and then we could do some reasoning on them. For example, we did this with the example of earthquakes and alarms in last uh, week's lecture, which essentially had um, a, a set omega that consisted of binary strings over these four binary variables in this graphical model that we looked at. 
But sometimes there are, actually almost all the time, there are reasoning pro processes in which we want to talk about so-called derived variables. Variables that aren't directly the ones on which we define the sigma algebra. To give you a trivial example or an easy one that might be easy to follow, consider the following situation. We have one coin, we're going to throw this coin n number of times. Every time we throw it, it has a probability f of coming up heads. Let's assume we throw it independent of each other. So every time we throw it, we create a new binary variable that we will call these binary variables x1 to xn if we throw the coin n times. And now a natural question you might want to ask is what's the probability for this, uh, these n coin tosses to produce exactly r heads and n minus r tails, naturally. Now, notice that here our definition of probabilities breaks down. So the um, atomic event uh, is, the, is the set of atomic events, is the space omega, which consists of all binary strings of length n. If we say that we encode heads and tails as binary variables 0 or 1. But the variable r that we talk about isn't actually an element of this uh, elementary space. It's a real number, sorry, it's a natural number that lies between 0 and n, of course, right? And that's a different space than omega. So we haven't actually defined a rule yet that allows us to talk about variables such as these. And of course, these are important. These are actually the variables we will typically talk about, derived variables that um, form by taking sums or other kind of algebraic operations on these elementary events. These kind of variables will be called random variables. And we will construct them in a formal way that does exactly what you want it to be. So if you, um, I mean, if you just look at this example for a moment, you can stop the video here if you like, and think about what the probability for this random variable is, then you'll probably come up with exactly the right rule. And what I'll do now is I'll just give you the formal definition of what this rule actually should be. And also, I'll define two concepts called measurable functions and random variables, and then use this to define this probability on this derived variable, which is called a distribution measure or a law of the probability of this random variable. Sorry, the law of the random variable. So first of all, we need to define a measurable function. Let's consider two measurable spaces. So that's two spaces, which both have um, an atomic set and a sigma algebra on it. In our example, this space is the space of all binary strings, and this space is the space of the natural numbers between 0 and n, which have sigma algebras. In both cases, these sigma algebras are trivial. They're just the power sets of these sets. And um, now consider a function x. So in our example, that was the function r that maps between these two spaces. This such a function will be called measurable if for any element g of the sigma algebra of this output space, the pre-image of this element is in the sigma algebra of the input space. So this means in our example, if every um, if the if the, the pre-image of any um, union, intersection, or difference of these, uh, of these power sets over the, this finite length um, uh, segment of the natural numbers is um, a corresponds to a measurable set of binary strings in the, so if, if every, for example, in particular, if every variable n of a number of heads showing up maps, it is reached from a set of um, configurations of the, of the coins that such that their, the sum of their heads is actually n. So why do we need such functions? Well, because if a function is measurable, then we are, so we're going to use such functions to, if you like, push forward the notion of probability from the atomic set of events coin tosses onto this derived space of numbers of heads. And we need to make sure that the, um, if we now talk about measurable sets on this derived space, that they, that it's such measurable sets kind of inherit the good properties of the original space. If um, uh, there is 
a probability on the original space, as we've just defined in our example, then because, because then we want to use these measurable functions to construct a new probability on the derived space. And we will call this derived probability a, measure, a, a distribution measure or the law of the random variable x. This distribution measure is defined in exactly the way you would imagine it to be. So I'm just going to tell you what the definition is and then we sh I'll, I'll show you, we'll go back to the example and check whether this definition actually makes sense. So consider a random variable, then the distribution measure or law of, uh, which we'll denote by Px of this random variable x, is defined for any um, element of the elementary events of the output space as, and therefore also of course to every element of the sigma algebra because we can then use sigma additivity to construct probabilities of elements of the sigma algebra as the following function. So that's Px of g, the, the law, uh, the, the probability of the set g under the law of x by taking the pre-image of g which is an element of the sigma algebra of the input space because we've assumed that x is a random variable so therefore this is a measurable set so x is a measurable um, function and this is a measurable set and then just look up what the probability of that measurable set in the original space was that's the um, probability of the set of all elementary events which are in the uh, pre-image of x under x of g. Okay, that was a complicated sentence. What does that actually mean? Let's go back to our example with um, coin tosses. So here our sigma algebra on the original space. The original space is the space of all binary strings from uh, of length uh, n. The sigma algebra on it is the power set. The random variable is called r. <coughs> it takes values, little r, from um, 0 to n. And our um, law, so we could write, oh, and I've already shortened our notation a little bit, I should have written p index r of r equal to little r is what? Well, we take the um, set of all configurations of heads and tails such that the total number of heads is r and then just check what its probability is. So under this generative process that I've defined up here, this probability is just a product of the individual probabilities because I've assumed that we're throwing this coin independent of each other. In a more general setting, it might be something else. You just have to look in the original space to see what in the original probability space to see what the probability is. Here, it's just the probability to get r heads and n minus r tails. What is that? Well, it's just the probability to get heads r times times the probability to get tails, which is 1 minus f, n minus r times. That's our probability for r. And we could actually say, um, uh, write this also as a conditional probability with some variables f and n, but we've assumed that we know what f and n is. So maybe it's not so necessary to actually write this and we will often just drop this kind of, uh, these kind of variables from the, from the notation. This is the law of this random variable, just to repeat again. The original space is the set of all binary strings. The sigma algebra on that original space is the power set of these binary strings. The random variable is defined by the function r, which is a measurable function, and we can use it to construct the distribution measure. We're almost done. We just haven't actually done this sum yet, so we haven't constructed what the, what the actual law is. To do that, we have to do again a little bit of combinatorics, which is a bit tedious, but all of you have done it in high school, so I'm not going to dwell on it much. We just need to get out the sum, so for that we need to compute the number of ways there are to choose r heads from um, the n possible, uh, from, from the n coin tosses that we've done in total. So how many binary strings are there in the set of all binary strings of length n such that they contain r ones? 
Well, that is just given by, and to get to this, you need to basically think about what you learned in high school, um, n factorial divided by n minus r factorial times r factorial, which is this n choose r function that you can just compute with your computer. And this gives rise to this law of this random variable that looks like this. So this is a um, probability distribution, as the name suggests, that distributes truth over the values from 0 to n. Here I've chosen n to be 10 and f I've chosen to be one third and this gives this kind of distribution. And what we'll actually typically do is, um, I've written this here with a note as well, we will abuse notation, this is a very common kind of thing to do, and we will first of all drop the, the subscript capital R because typically we will know what function we're talking about and I won't write capital R is equal to the value R, so the random variable R takes the value little r, but I said I'll just write little r. I'm allowed to do this because we make this assumption that probabilities know the name of their input variable. Actually, this seems sort of complicated, like a, a while ago this seemed really complicated to do this or would, would be maybe a, a weird notation, but in your generation it should be easy to think about it this way because you're used to programming languages that do that as well. So for example in Python, Python knows the name of the individual variables, you know you have this concept of a named variable that can be entered into, the, into each function and there are also Python functions that just assume that the first input you plug in could be interpreted as a certain kind of variable, so this is exactly what's happening here. We could either tell the function that we're talking about the random variable r, or we could just say, you probably know what I mean when I write little r. Okay, this allows us to define this distribution. By the way, there's a name for this distribution, it's called the binomial distribution, which is the law of the random variable given by the sum over successful so-called Bernoulli experiments. Bernoulli experiments are coin tosses. Okay, that was problem number one. We are now allowed to talk about derived variables, which is obviously a very powerful concept. And there's one more problem that we briefly have to talk about, and that's continuous input spaces. So in all the examples I've shown you so far, the set of atomic events, omega, was a, a countable, actually it was typically a finite discrete set. On such sets, it's trivial to define a sigma algebra, you just take the power set, the set of all subsets of omega. Um, it's easy, you can show this yourself, that this power set is a sigma algebra, it fulfills all of the axioms. However, in continuous spaces, which we want to talk about as well, of course, uh, uh, measurable, uh, sorry, not all sets, and in particular not the power set in general, are measurable. So, of course, we want to talk in our applications about real valued variables. We want to talk about rates and velocities and positions in time and space, and these are all real valued, so they come from an uncountable space. And there is a weird problem that in such spaces, not all sets are measurable. If you haven't heard about this before, I'm not going to tell you how this works because actually showing, constructing a non-measurable set takes about 10 minutes itself and it's really confusing. These are typically really odd sets to construct, but um, I, if you want to know more about it, just go on Wikipedia and, check and look up non-measurable set and you can find out for yourself. These are uh, typically constructed in a very cautious way such that they are, end up being non-measurable. Suffice it to say that this problem exists and therefore we can't really define sigma algebras by using the power set. Um, early on in the 20th century, by the way, these non-measurable sets were a real problem and they caused all sorts of big discussion. Um, today we just know that they exist and we have to deal with them. So what that means is we can't that, so, so just to be clear, this doesn't mean that we can't define sigma algebras on continuous spaces. It just means that we can't take what would be the canonical sigma algebra on discrete spaces, which is the power set. So instead we have to find some other way of constructing sigma algebras. And um, one canonical way to do so, or actually the canonical way to do so, is uh, works on continuous spaces that are topological spaces. Topological spaces are spaces that allow the definition of open sets. So that's actually a circular sentence I just said. Here is what a topology actually is. So um, consider a space, omega, and consider a collection of sets on that space. 
such a collection is called a topology on the space omega if it contains both the entire space and the empty set. And for all its elements, it holds that potentially infinite unions of these sets and finite intersections of these sets are also an element of the topology. That's an abstract definition. That's one of the advantages of topologies, that they are very abstract. But for typical applications, for real vector spaces, you can uh, think of them as the canonical neighborhoods. So, um, for of, as the topology for R to the D, as this collection of all sets U, which have the property that if X is in U, then there um, exists a positive number such that all real numbers which are um, closer to x than epsilon, strictly closer, are also an element of u. So literally, intuitively, this means for any real number, the uh, set of neighborhoods is the set of all sets around this real number that um, in, include all points of um, distance at most, but not um, an epsilon, any arbitrary epsilon. We can do this on the real line because of this, the existence of this function, of this norm. So we can compute the, um, or this metric, right? So we can compute the distance between these two points in the natural way. So if, if uh, d is one in the univariate case, we can just take the distance between two points, so that's the difference between these two real numbers and then the absolute value of it, and call that the distance. And in the d-dimensional multivariate extension, we just take the uh, sum of squares and take the square root of these uh, distances, right? So you might have noticed already, staring at this definition, even if you haven't seen the definition of a topology before, you might have noticed that it actually sounds quite a lot like the definition of a sigma algebra. It's almost a sigma algebra, it's just missing a few key pieces. So here I have the two definitions next to each other. Here's the definition of a sigma algebra, literally copied and pasted from the previous slides. Here's the definition of a topology. A sigma algebra is a collection of sets. So that, here it is, it's a subset of the set of all sets. So that's a collection of sets, just like a topology. A sigma algebra contains the entire set, just like a topology. Sigma algebras also contain all potentially infinite unions of their elements, just like a topology. And sigma algebras also contain all potentially infinite intersections of their sets. This in particular also implies that it contains the empty set just like a topology. Why does it imply that? Do you know? It implies that because you can take two sets that don't intersect and then their intersection is the empty set and it has to be by that rule in the sigma algebra. Now, um, however, the sigma algebra also requires two additional things. First of all, um, differences of two sets have to be in the sigma algebra. That's not true for the topology. By the way, what's the difference between the two sets? Just in case you haven't heard, this is the set A, and this is the set B. The difference between A and B is this part that excludes this bit. Okay? Now, so that this is the complement in A of the intersection of A and B. So to define that, we need complements of sets. And there's a very subtle difference, which you might have noticed looking at this, that topologies allow finite intersections and sigma algebras allow infinite intersections. So if you think about this for a little bit, you might come to the conclusion for yourself that to turn a topology into a sigma algebra, we only have to add certain sets. So what we can do to construct a sigma algebra is to take a topology and then sort of check mentally 
which sets we have to add to get to in particular allow all infinite intersections of elements of the topology and to get all differences of elements of the topology. It turns out that those sets are always available and we can always add them to get a sigma algebra and the resulting sigma algebra is called the Borel sigma algebra. Here's the definition. Consider a topological space. The Borel sigma algebra is the sigma algebra that is generated by the topology. That means you arrive at it by taking the topology and include all infinite intersections of elements of the topology and all complements in omega of elements of the topology. This then ensures that you can build differences between sets and therefore you have a sigma algebra. Now, this sounds like a lot of abstract nonsense and maybe it is, but it's just a, a, um, a permission for us to talk about probability measures on continuous spaces. I haven't told you yet how to actually construct these in practice. We'll do that in a moment. But what this sentence actually says, what this definition up there says is that on continuous spaces that are topological spaces, there exists a sigma algebra. It's called the Borel sigma algebra. By the way, the Borel sigma algebra is the smallest by definition sigma algebra generate that which includes all the open sets of the topology. And in this lecture, we will just assume that we have such a space, which means that we will only ever define random variables that map from discrete, typically even finite, or Euclidean spaces. Euclidean spaces are topological spaces, so typically R to the D, um, or binary strings, um, essentially, so discrete finite spaces. On both of these, we now know that there are sigma algebras. Actually, we have identified which sigma algebras we're going to use, either the power set for uh, discrete spaces or the Borel sigma algebra. And therefore, we are allowed to define probabilities and we, can, we now know that the, the, both the axioms of probability theory hold and the mechanisms, Bayes' theorem in particular, and the sum and the product rule are allowed to be used. And we can um, be sure that all derived properties of um, uh, probabilistic inference will actually hold. Um, by the way, on continuous, uh, sorry, on, uh, on spaces that allow the construction of Borel sigma algebras, there is a nice result, which I'm not going to prove, that if you have two spaces which um, have Borel sigma algebras, then any continuous function x is measurable and can thus be used to define a random variable. So this allows us to say, um, and this is actually follows almost by definition because that's how you define a continuous function, that uh, pre-images of open sets are open sets. That's the topological way of defining continuity. So this uh, gives us basically a set of, of situations which we are now to, allowed to consider, and it's a very rich set of situ situations. It's a set, or it's a situations that can be described by variables that are either an element of a discrete space or an element of a topological space, actually a Euclidean space. And if you allow functions that are continuous, and as you know, the set of continuous functions is very large, then um, any, all such functions, all such continuous functions can be used to define random variables and therefore laws of derived variables. We only have to be careful. The only alarm bell we have, and have to have in our head is when we start talking about derived variables that arise as non-continuous functions. Good. Now that we can define these, um, these uh, Borel sigma algebras, we can have one gray slide that um, summarizes what we just did. I introduced two notions. The first one is that of a random variable. The second one is that of a Borel sigma algebra. A random variable is our way of constructing probabilities on derived variables. Such derived probabilities are called um, the law of the random variable or also known as the distribution measure of that random variable. And quite often, I'm just going to say the distribution of this variable. And I'm not even going to say it's a random variable. I'm not even going to say that it's the law or it's the distribution measure. I'll just say the distribution or the measure and use that almost interchangeably because in all of the applications we will talk about, these technicalities really don't matter. It just was important to do it once properly. And Borel sigma algebras are our license, our permission to talk about probabilities 
on Euclidean, or more generally, topological spaces. Yeah, they allow us to talk about probabilities that are defined on continuous spaces. I'm specifically saying they allow us to talk about them because they don't actually tell us how to talk about them. To do that, we have to move to the next slide, but maybe this is your chance to take a quick break. So this thought process has now shown us that we can define probabilities on continuous spaces. It just hasn't really told us how to do so in practice. Now it turns out that all reasonable probability distributions, if you like, allow a representation that is particularly convenient. And this representation is known as a probability density function. A probability density function is a function that satisfies the following definition. So consider a Borel sigma algebra and a probability measure on it. Now, some probability measures have the property that there exists a function p, which um, is a non-negative measurable function on the, um, the, the space that we have defined our probability on, which satisfy that the fact that the property that for all elements of the sigma algebra, this probability can be written as an integral over this particular function. And these functions are then called probability density functions. Now, th so that what that means is if P has such a density, then all probabilities that you might be interested in, so all probabilities over arbitrary elements of the sigma algebra can be written as integrals. Now it turns out that not all probability measures have densities. In particular, there are uh, measures that have point masses and those can't be written with densities because then they don't allow integrals. However, it works the other way around. All non-negative measurable functions which integrate to one on the entire domain are probability density functions of some probability measure, which is then defined in exactly this kind of way. So if we have a density, we can use it to define a probability measure. And it turns out that many interesting measures actually also can be represented by a probability density function. So therefore, almost for the entirety of the course, we will talk a lot about PDFs, probability density functions. These are connected to another notion called the cumulative density function, the CDF. The cumulative density function is actually a more general notion that um, exists for all probability measures. It's the uh, probability measures on continuous domains, sorry. So consider a probability measure on our um, Borel probability space. Then we can define a cumulative density uh, distribution function, CDF. Sorry, I did I just say cumulative density function? That's wrong. A cumulative distribution function, CDF by defining it as a function f that takes as its input uh, a point in this space and then computes the probability for um, um, that is, is assigned to the set that contains all values x that are smaller in all elements than x. So in the univariate case it's easier to think about this. It's the probability that is assigned to the set of all variables to the left-hand side of uh, x. I hope this is the right way around for you. Yeah, left-hand side of x. Now, if it's actually sufficiently differentiable, which it isn't always, but if it is sufficiently differentiable, then p actually has a density, and that density is given by the derivative of f. That this is then true follows from the central theorem of calculus. Now, this sounds like CDFs are the more fundamental object and PDFs are derived if they exist. So CDFs always exist, but PDFs only exist if the CDF is sufficiently differentiable. However, in practice, the PDF, the probability density function, is actually the object we really care about. Why? Because the PDF essentially transfers the rules of probability without change directly to the continuous domain. What I mean by that is the following. PDFs have the property that their, their integral over the entire domain is equal to 1. That's true because um, of, the, of Kolmogorov's fourth axiom, which, runs, which, is one, which is the axiom that says probabilities of the entire elementary domain, uh, atomic set, have to be 1. Secondly, 
if we have a bivariate uh, space of uh, random variables x1 and x2 with a density, a PDF, then the marginal density, so that's the probability density function or associated with the measure on one of them, x1, is given by what you expect, the integral over the other variable, over the bivariate PDF. And of course, the, other, the same for the other variable, x2. So this is the sum rule. The only thing we've done is we've replaced the capital P's with little key, uh, lowercase p's, and we've replaced the sums with integrals. Very natural to do, right? And conditional densities uh, have the same form. So if we have a, a joint PDF over a bivariate random variable, then the conditional distribution of one given the other, assuming that the marginal distribution of the other, uh, sorry, the marginal density of the other is uh, non-zero, it can be written in this exact way. I'm not showing that this is the case, it's just the case, um, and I'll just leave it to you to think about why that's the case. So therefore, PDFs essentially fulfill the sum rule and the product rule, at least intuitively, right? You can just replace all capital P's with lowercase p's and all sums with integrals and you get back the rules essentially that we've already seen for probabilities again in probability densities. That's not true for commutative density functions because they are like integrals from a certain direction up on through this space. So therefore we can also apply, we can also like because these two hold and Bayes theorem is a direct corollary of them Bayes theorem also applies to PDFs. And that's actually what we are going to do all the time when we talk about probabilities. We will not actually talk about the probabilities themselves. We will talk about the densities and operate on densities by applying Bayes theorem to them. Why does this work, you might think? Well, the reason it works is really just intuitively that these are densities. We're talking about probability density functions. These are just densities of masses. So you can think about probabilities as mass, as truth, um, distributed across a space so that each part of the space contains a certain mass and the densities are the infinitesimal versions of that. And if you think about your physical intuition, then densities transform like masses. The only um, thing that separates a mass from a density is the amount of space over which you integrate. So that will mean that that, that will also define the, the one difference between the density and the probability, which is that if we change the space over which we integrate to get um, uh, our unit mass, then we have to think carefully about how the densities change. And we'll do that in a moment. Before we do that though, I want to show you a bit of an intuitive picture. So here is a probability density function in red. I've uh, just chosen one. So what a probability density function is, is a potentially multivariate function. So it takes a potentially multivariate input, in this case over two variables, x and y. And it assigns to every point in this space a non-negative real number such that the integral over this entire space is unit, is one. By the way, this doesn't necessarily mean that this PDF never exceeds in value the value 1. There might be locations with density higher than 1 because you might concentrate all of the mass or a large part of the mass of the entire probability into a sub part, a subsection of this space that has measure less than 1. And once we have such a bivariate distribution, then we can, and density, then uh, we can talk about both conditional and marginal distributions. So this colorful thing in the middle is the joint distribution. The marginal distribution over the variable y is what we get if we take this multivariate distribution and we project it onto y. So we integrate out x. On the other hand, the conditional distribution is what we get if we um, cut through the distribution at a particular point. Um, so, for example, in here, oops, I'm sorry, from through this part of the distribution, if you take a cut through here, then you get this black line, and that's a conditional distribution for x, so that's a function of x, 
given that we know that y is, a, is at a particular point. So this is a, an intuitive picture of what a probability density is and probability density functions are the objects we are going to uh, use almost exclusively when we actually operate with probabilities because most of the time the variables we care about are not going to be discrete but continuous so we have to use them and thankfully some product and base rule apply to all uh, of the two, two PDFs so therefore they're quite natural to use. There is however one caveat with probability density functions and that is because they are constructed essentially indirectly by taking the derivative of the cumulative distribution function, they do transform non-trivially. And this is something that is best just written down. And um, I will give you a quick proof, just pictorially almost, to give you a feeling for how this comes about, and then just actually done in an exercise, which we'll do later on in this term. So consider a probability density function over a variable which we call x, a random variable, capital X, which might take values little x. And it's defined over some domain from the, which has a left and a right hand side. Then we can construct a new random variable by um, constructing a function u, which um, we require to be monotonic and differentiable because then it has an inverse. Um, and so this monotonic differentiable function creates a, so this is, is, is itself a random variable that defines a new quantity y and this new quantity y also has a probability density function if this uh, transformation is monotonic and differentiable and this new pdf is given by this object p of y so here I, y, there are two y's in here. Right? The index is supposed to say that this is a function that um, takes as its input the variable that we call y at the value y, which is given by the old PDF that we just uh, know, and then multiplied by this mm, uh, absolute value of a derivative of the inverse of v, which actually for these monotonic differentiable invertible functions is given by the inverse of the derivative of the function u. This is like an infinitesimal version of the definition of a random variable that we did earlier today. And why does it have exactly this form? Well, it has this form because PDFs are defined through cumulative distribution functions, through CD CDFs, and the CDFs are really the fundamental objects because they, they define the probabilities. We've defined the entire theory around probabilities, not around densities. So we have to make sure that the densities conform with what we've done to probabilities. Why is this the exactly right form? Well, here's a simple proof below. Just consider the derivative of this function, which exists because we've assumed so, and it's larger than zero because it's a monotonic function. Now, uh, we could consider two points. This is the situation here. Consider two points, um, uh, C1 and C2 in X. Then Y, which is U of X, lies between a domain D1 and D2, where D1 is less than D2 because it's a monotonic function. And we can now think about the cumulative density function, uh, distribution function, CDF, of Y. This cumulative distribution function is by definition given by uh, this expression. So now we want to replace the y with x. We do that by first um, thinking about what this actually means in x in terms of u, but u is invertible, so we can also directly talk about x. And this is basically what the definition of, uh, what we previously did for the definition of um, uh, random variables, or we essentially using the definition of a random variable to replace the probability of um, to write the probability of y in terms of a probability on x and um, then use the fact that x has a density to write this uh, cumulative distribution function of x as an integral. Now this is a way of dividing the cumulative density function of y 
in terms of an integral over the PDF of x. That's convenient because we now can construct from here the PDF of y, which is just defined to be the derivative of um, this uh, CDF of y. Well, what is that? Well, we know that it's this function. So we just take this function and take its derivative with respect to y. So that's a simple form of uh, calculus, which using the chain rule tells us that we have to take this px of v of y and um, multiply with the derivative of this function v with respect to y. Now notice that v, because u is a monotonic function, its inverse is also a monotonic function and it's also monotonically increasing. So if you take a look at this picture, you can think of, so this is u of x, you can mentally flip this around and notice that it's still a monotonically increasing function. So for monotonically increasing functions, this works. How about monotonically decreasing functions? So for these, the situation is ever so slightly more complicated, but it's basically an analogous. So imagine that we have a function that is um, monotonically decreasing. Now the first thing that actually changes now is, so I've take, drawn a little picture here. We have a decreasing function u of x. So the first thing that happens is that our integration domains are exchanged. So if we have a look, a region in which x goes from c1 to c2, then that actually means that y, which is the map from x to y, lies between d1 and d2, but d2 is less than d1. And the cumulative distribution function of y is still given by, uh, by definition, by the probability measure assigned to the region to the left of y. We plug in the definition of um, y in terms of x, use the definition of a random variable, and now we have to, um, there's a larger than in here rather than a less than, so we need to do the integral the other way around. We know what the integral is at infinity because the integral over um, the entire domain from minus infinity to plus infinity is one. So we can write this, um, well, it's not really a cumulative distribution function, but we can write this kind of function with, with this sort of probability over the region to the right of V of Y as one minus the probability for the region to the left of Y. And uh, plug in the definition in terms of the density, which works because P is assumed to have a density. And again, now do everything as before. So this density we're looking for is given by the derivative of the cumulative distribution function. This, if you compute it actually here, there's not going to be a minus here showing up. Other than that, everything is the same because the derivative of one with respect to y is zero. And what now changing is that we have the derivative of v of y, which is the inverse of u. And if you look again, uh, at this picture, if you mentally flip the axes of this function around, then the inverse of a monotonically decreasing function is also monotonically decreasing, so it has a negative derivative, and minus times minus is plus, so we, get, um, we can write this expression with the absolute value of the derivative. That's exactly what we're looking for. So this was the univariate case. For the multivariate case, situ the situation is a bit more complicated. I'm just going to show you what it is because this isn't a calculus class. So um, we, um, I will just tell you what the answer is. So if you have a multivariate joint density over multiple random variables and consider a continuously differentiable injective function with non-vanishing Jacobian, so that's the corresponding concept to a monotonic function in the one-dimensional case, then the derived variable y, which is g of x, has a density that is given by the density of the original variable at its pre-image of uh, y under g times the determinant of the Jacobian matrix of the inverse of the function of g. So this sounds really complicated. There's a determinant, there's a Jacobian matrix. If you don't know what a Jacobian is, by the way, then please look it up. Um, it's a matrix of partial derivatives of elements of the multivariate function. So this sounds complicated, but it's not going to be that complicated in actual applications. So later this term, we will get to see, we'll actually get exercises where you have to do this transformation. And if you actually do it mechanically, like if, you, if, you, if I give you a concrete function, then it's usually quite straightforward to write down Jacobians, to compute the determinants, at least numerically, 
um, construct the inverse and so on, and then you'll find that this just does something non-trivial. The only thing you really have to keep in mind, and this is our next gray slide, is first of all that probability density functions are an important concept we're going to use all over the place. They distribute probability across continuous domains. Not every measure has a density, but all probability density functions define measures. Probability density functions are um, non-negative real-valued functions which are integrable such that their integral over the entire domain is 1 and they satisfy when we interpret them as defining a probability measure these three rules which are continuous analogs of the sum rule, the product rule and Bayes theorem and they actually look a lot like the sum rule, the product rule and Bayes theorem so therefore we can really do probabilistic inference using these density functions rather than the probabilities, which are actually the fundamental object. The only thing you have to be really careful about with densities is if you change the variable, in a, particularly in a nonlinear fashion. I mean, also in a linear fashion, but particularly in a nonlinear fashion. So if you can construct the derived variables from underlying variables, then the densities transform in this non-trivial way that involves the Jacobian of the inverse of your transform and its determinant. At least that's true if you have a transformation that is actually invertible. With that, let's take a quick break and then we'll do something much more fun. We'll do an, exper an experiment. I know that these very theoretical derivations are tedious. They can be boring, especially if you're not someone who's particularly excited about mathematics. So let's end this lecture with a real example to finally start doing some ever so simplistic machine learning. Let's look at a real example. Let's say I want to know how many people, what the what, what, what's the proportion of people in the population that wear glasses. That's maybe a bit of a stupid question to ask, but of course it's a template for a fundamental kind of question that you might want to know, like ask questions that you might want to ask about the population or the world at large. So how do you do this? Using a probabilistic or if you like a Bayesian approach. Now this is one of these points where normally I would ask you questions in the lecture hall and then we would have a discussion about it and we would slowly go through it and hopefully that would help your mind to follow along. Now, unfortunately, because of Corona, we can't do this. So I implore you, try to slow down the video, stop it here and there, think for yourself. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to follow this, this example. So how do we do this? Well, we're going to define a probabilistic generative model, which allows us to do Bayesian inference. And here is how this works. We begin by introducing a random variable up, um, for this quantity that we care about. Let's call it pi, the probability to wear glasses. Pi is maybe a bit of a weird symbol, but obviously I can't use p because it's already used for probability distributions. So we're going to use pi and say, I want to know this unknown probability, pi. That's obviously a real number between 0 and 1. So for some of you, it might already be confusing that we're trying to learn a probability with probabilities. But probabilities are just numbers, right? Real numbers between 0 and 1. And there's nothing that forbids us from trying to learn a probability with probabilities. So there is this number. It lies between 0 and 1. If it's 0, then it means there are, there's no one in the entire population who wears glasses. Now, if it's 1, that means everyone's wearing glasses. And if it's 0.5, that means half the population is wearing glasses. OK? And now we're going to assume that we can do experiments. Now, in any other year, I would do this by actually doing the experiment in the classroom and go around and look at people. That's one opportunity for us to finally get to know each other in lecture three. We can't do that today. So please imagine me walking around, looking at individual people and asking, is this person wearing glasses? Are they not wearing glasses? Are they wearing glasses? Is this not wearing glasses? And every single time you make such an observation, we are essentially collecting the value of one more random variable x. Let's call it xi, x1, x2, x3, and so on. 
That's all we need. Those are all the random variables we care about. And now we just have to define probability measures. And because pi is a, a real value, we'll typically define a probability density function over it. And then afterwards, everything is just Bayesian inference. So how we do that? Well, we're just going to use Bayes' theorem, right? So that's the mechanism we have agreed to use. We're never going to question it. That's just how probability theory works because that's what our axioms told us to do. And the only quick question is what are the terms in Bayes' theorem? What's the prior and what's the likelihood? So we need to assign actual values to these. Now let's start with the prior. For simplicity, I'll do something very simple because one of the arguments I want to make is that the prior doesn't matter so much. Maybe I just, I just assign a uniform prior. So pi is a number between 0 and 1, so it ranges from 0 to 1. And we could just, just say every single number in that domain, including 0 and 1, are equally probable if we don't know anything yet. So there's just a flat distribution. This works because it's a bounded domain and the integral from 0 to 1 over the function 1 is just 1. Great. That's our prior. Now the tricky bit is what is the likelihood? What's the probability to observe someone wearing glasses if the true probability of wearing glasses is pi? Now I know that this weird seemingly recursive definition or kind of object is confusing to many people. So there's this probability which we call pi we want to know about it, but we don't know it. That's the probability, though, that tells us what the probability is to observe someone wearing glasses. So actually, and this is one of these points where please stop the video and think about it for yourself so that you can have this insight for yourself. But now that you've maybe restarted it, I can tell you that the likelihood to observe someone wearing glasses if the true probability to observe someone wearing glasses is pi is just pi, right? And what's the probability of observing someone who is not wearing glasses if the probability to observe someone wearing glasses is pi? It's 1 minus pi, of course. Great. So that's it. We're done. We just, now we can do Bayesian inference. Oh, actually, almost done. There's this annoying normalization constant, the evidence that we have to compute, the probability to observe um, someone wearing glasses. So um, for that, we need to just integrate this probability density function because that's just now a function, right? So we just have to do it and it turns out that that's a function that can be integrated and it's called the beta function and um, it'll just allow our computer to do that. Now, instead of doing this, I'll show you a demo. See if this works. It's a little bit of a trick to do this. It's different from my usual setup. So, okay. Imagine me walking around the lecture hall now and saying we want, let's assume the people in the, in the, in the lecture hall are a sample from the population and we um, are going to uh, collect individual samples. So this, what you're currently seeing, is our prior, right? That's a function that maps from 0 to 1 uh, onto the uh, reals, and it assigns a probability density function of 1 to every single number between 0 and 1. That's a probability density function because it's non-negative, and it integrates to 1, and it's integrable. Now, let's say I see the very first person in the front row and they are wearing glasses. How lucky are we? Now, what I need to do to do Bayesian inference is I need to multiply this prior with that likelihood to observe this person wearing glasses. And that's, as we just saw, this function which we call, which is just the function x, or pi, actually. So this is typically the most confusing part of this experiment to most people. So let's go slow. The probability if the true probability to wear glasses is zero, and I see someone wearing glasses, and the probability of that happening is zero, right? It would be zero, that's what the likelihood tells us. If I, the true probability to observe someone wearing glasses is 30%, and I observe someone wearing glasses, that, the probability of that happening is 30%. 
If the true probability of wearing glasses is 90%, then observing someone with wearing glasses happens with probability. Um, oops, I'm sorry, I'm pointing at the wrong line. That's the right line, the dashed one. Then the probability is 90%, right? So notice that the likelihood is a function of the latent variable, not the observable. The observed variable is the thing that the likelihood assigns a probability to. The likelihood is a probability over the data, but a likelihood for the latent quantity. So it's a function of the thing we don't know. And now we can reason about what the true probability might be. And to do that, we do Bayes' theorem, which means multiply this dashed line with the straight line, so prior times likelihood, and then normalize by the evidence. So what's the evidence? The evidence is the integral over the product of these two functions. Well, okay, so the, the prior is a, uniform fun is a unit function, so it doesn't do anything. So the evidence is just the integral over this dashed red line from 0 to 1. Well, what's that integral? Oh, that's again something you can think about for yourself. Maybe if you, if you want, stop the video. It's obviously 1 half, right? Of course, because there is a rectangle here of size 1. And we've just drawn a straight line through it, dividing it in half. So, of course, it's one half, right? So, we get to um, multiply this by a factor of two. So, that's one over one half. Huh? And we're left with, that, with the black line. That's our posterior density function. Great. Okay. That's our posterior. Okay. That was Bayesian inference. Done. Right? Now, of course, there's not just one person in the, in the, in, in the audience, right? Now, let's say... I go and meet another person sitting right next to them and they are not wearing glasses. Okay, so now how do I do Bayesian inference? Well, actually, I already have a posterior from the previous observation. That posterior is this probability density function. So the likelihood to observe the next person wearing or not wearing glasses has nothing to do with the first person other than the probability to observe someone wearing glasses. So, you can already think about conditional independence. We'll talk about that in a moment. So that means I can just multiply that prior, which is my previous posterior, right? So the posterior from, from just before is now my prior, which I multiply with the likelihood for this observation to observe someone who is not wearing glasses. And we realized before that that likelihood is one minus that probability. So what I've done here is I've now multiplied this prior density function with this likelihood. So that's just 1 minus pi. And then divided by the normalization constant. So the normalization constant is the integral over the product of these two functions. These, this product of these two functions is some, is some kind of um, parabola like this. It's actually a parabola. And... Um, I, um, uh, that, that, the, the, I mean, the unnormalized one is a little bit uh, further down. I've just re-normalized so that it's a probability distribution. Computing this integral under this, like this, this area under this quadratic function is, of course, an ever so slightly non-trivial problem. But, of course, I'm sure you can do that for yourself, maybe even in your head, right? Integrating a quadratic function is not that hard. Now, let's say I make one more observation and the next per person is also not wearing glasses. What do I do now? I hope that by now you've understood what's going on. This is now our prior after two observations. I get a third observation and I just multiply with the likelihood for that third observation again. That likelihood is again 1 minus pi because I've assumed I've seen someone who doesn't, who's not wearing glasses. And this is now the posterior distribution. The integral now gets a little bit harder because we're now integrating this complicated polynomial. Um, but let's just say we can do that. I mean, we have a computer, right? Computers can do cool things. So um, let's do that. And now we're beginning to do machine learning, right? We let our computer do the integration for us and it's constructing a posterior distribution for us. Now let's say the next person is also not wearing glasses. I just keep, keep multiplying in likelihoods. Then there's a person who is wearing glasses and another one wearing glasses and one wearing not wearing glasses and another one wearing glasses and here's a person wearing glasses and here's someone not wearing glasses and, and another one not wearing glasses and another one not wearing glasses and someone wearing glasses and so on and so on and so on. Usually I actually do this by going through like a significant part of the lecture hall until we have something like, you know, 20 people or so um, that we've seen. 
And then the distribution looks something like this. So what you've just seen here, what you're currently seeing here is the most recent observation is someone who is wearing glasses. And that was the prior before the observation. And this is the posterior after this observation. And what this now tells us is we've learned something. We know that, that the probability to wear glasses is definitely not zero and definitely not one. And it's also quite unlikely to be 90 or 80% or 10 or 20% just because of the ratio of people we've seen wearing glasses or not wearing glasses. But after 21 people, we're still not sure, right? We really don't know what it is because it might be any number between, let's say, 20% and 70%. I mean, of course, it could be any number between 0 and 1 other than 0 and 1. It can't be 0 or 1 because otherwise we couldn't have seen both positive and negative cases. But those are now very unlikely. And if we keep doing this, then over time, this distribution will concentrate around a value which actually tells us what the probability is to wear glasses. Now, I know that people will have many questions about this. They always have, and that's great. Let's talk about it in the flipped classroom. Please, if you're confused by this, write down your questions and we will talk about it. I have to tell you where this experiment comes from. It's one of the oldest questions of statistics, of course, right? And it was actually discussed long before statistics were a thing. It goes back, and for this I need to switch back to slides. to this wonderful man who you've seen before. He's called Pierre Simon, Marquis de Laplace. I'm actually not sure whether he was already a Marquis by the time that he wrote this, this, this text. Um, and he wrote about this experiment in his uh, famous book, Theory Analytique de Probabilité. Now, if you can read French, here is his real citation. Normally, I would do a simple, a silly joke in the, in the lecture hall and ask you whether someone can translate this for us. And then when you're laboriously trying to, to drag out your high school level French and try to understand what he's saying, I say, don't worry about it. By now we have cool machine learning technologies that can translate um, texts for us. So we don't need you anymore. And here is the English translation as created by a deep network. The probability, oops, the probability of most simple events is unknown. Laplace writes, considering it a priori, which is what we just did, it seems susceptible to all values between zero and unity, right? We just put it a uniform prior between zero and one. But if one has observed a result composed of several of these events, the way they enter them makes some of these values more probable than others. The posterior starts contracting until we get an a posteriori uh, concentrated distribution. Thus, as the observed results are composed by the development of simple events, their real possibility becomes more and more known. And it becomes more and more probable that it falls within limits that constantly tighten, would end up coinciding with the number of simple events became infinite. If the number of, of simple events became infinite. Now, obviously, Laplace writing in 1814 didn't have access yet to the wonderful compact mathematical notation that we use today but he was thinking along the exact same lines. So what we're going to do now is we're going to um, uh, go through this exercise again more slowly to think about how this fits into our cooking recipe for Bayesian inference. For that, let me just briefly switch something. All right, so let's go through this experiment once more, but a bit more mathematically, not staring at a demo, but uh, trying to think about what just happened. So um, we've actually followed the cooking recipe that I outlined in the last lecture. Remember, I quoted David Mackay, always write down the probability of everything. So here's our cooking recipe again. How do we build a probabilistic machine learning method? It's actually, I mean, you could call it a probabilistic inference scheme, but that's what it is. It's a machine learning method. All good learning machines are probabilistic inference schemes. It's just sometimes hard to notice that they are. So we're going to start by defining our probability space. And now that we've talked about random variables, we can actually talk about random variables rather than this complicated sigma algebra notion. So you, you might notice that in many texts, people just define random variables. And that's because random variables are a function. And because even the most basic functions can be thought of as being functions from an even more basic uh, space and 
maybe even the same space mapping onto itself, it's enough to just talk about random variables as the objects of interest. Here we have two kinds of random variables. One of them is the probability to wear glasses, that's a real number, and the other ones are, and the real number lies between 0 and 1, sorry, um, including 0 and 1, and we have the observations. Let's say there are five of them, or n of them, right? And then actually n is another parameter of this model, and the xi are the individual observations, the random variables. Then, um, oh, yeah, I just told you this, right? So these are binary variables that lie between 0 and 1. And now we can draw a graphical model if you like, right? So this is actually the beginning of step number two. So the first step is to write down our, we call it, well, you could say the sigma algebra, define the probability space, or also just say what the random variables are. And now we can start thinking about how the situation is going to look like in terms of conditional independence. So we'll draw a picture like this which says, so there is this unknown variable, which is the probability to observe um, someone wearing glasses, and it's generating all the other ones. So we're, we can draw from this probability over and over again, independently for each of these observations, and identically because each of these, this, these uh, variables is drawn with the same probability. So these variables down here, x1 to x5, will, will be said to be identically and independently distributed, IID. Um, and so now comes a little bit of simplification in the notation. So um, formally, we would have to say there is this random variable called Y, a random variable being a function, and it takes values pi between 0 and 1. But we're just going to be talking about pi because that's the value we actually care about, right? So the function doesn't matter so much, it's the value of that function. And the same for the capital XI, the random variables. We'll just write the lowercase x. And actually, this is the last time they're going to be so formal. In the future, I will always just write real numbers for the values, and I'm often not even going to be talking about random variables at all. Just values to which we assign probability density functions. Then um, we need, uh, for our generative model, we need a prior and a likelihood. Together they make a joint distribution. So p of pi times p of xi given pi gives a p of xi and pi, uh, comma pi. That's all we need once we have a probability distribution. Everything else is just mechanical Bayesian inference. So um, to do Bayesian inference, we start with a prior. You could think of this as the probability for pi given that you know nothing if you find priors weird. And then um, compute the probability to wear, for someone to wear glasses after the first observation. For that, you multiply the prior by the likelihood and you divide by the evidence. Bayes' theorem. We are going to, I'm going to, uh, to sort of to drive home this point of the structure of this equation, I'm going to call this integral down here z1, that's a normalization constant. I'm doing this to say that this down here is if, we, if we're thinking about pi, which we do, then this is just a number, it's just a real number, right? It's an integral over pi. So it doesn't depend on pi anymore. Once we've integrated it out, it's just a number. So we might as well write it in front. The interesting bit, all the structure is in this stuff behind it, the, the likelihood times the prior. So that's our posterior. And now imagine we see a second observation. So in the demo, I said, oh, so now the posterior becomes the prior and I just get one more likelihood and we get a, and we get a posterior again. Why am I allowed to do this? You might have thought for yourself. That's maybe one of the many questions that come up. Well, I'm allowed to do this because of the structure of this generative model, because the samples are IID. So let's say I see a second observation. Then, um, so now we have, we have seen two numbers, x1 and x2. So the, um, the Proper mechanics of probabilistic inference tell us that um, to get this posterior, we need to use Bayes' theorem and write down the joint distribution of all three variables, pi, x1, and x2, and then the normalization constant. So z2, you can think about this for yourself, what this is, but it's an integral over pi over this expression down here, or up here, maybe. So, um, what I've done here is I've already factorized this distribution. So of course I could have written here p of pi comma x1 comma x2. And then because of the product rule, I'm allowed to rewrite this most generally as x2 given x given x1 and pi times x1 given pi times pi, p of pi. Right? Of course I could permute all the variables in here. 
um, if I wanted to, because the product rule is uh, generally true for all permutations of the variables. However, this particular factorization is useful because I can now use the assumptions of, um, of IID-ness, of independence, given pi. The graphical model on the previous slide encoded a conditional independent structure. It's one of these fan-out elementary structures, right? Um, which say that when conditioned on pi, then x2 is actually independent of x1. So I can get rid of this x1 in this expression and just write it like this. And now notice that this here before, up to the normalization, which I've absor absorbed into this real number, is actually just the previous posterior times a new likelihood. So normalization doesn't matter because after the, after the inference step, we will always have a probability distribution, even if, so even if this thing that we integrated over here isn't a, 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 a joint probability distribution, as long as it's, it's a non-negative function that integrates to a finite number, afterwards, we'll have, we're going to have a normalized probability distribution. So that's why we get to do our um, uh, yesterday's posterior is today's prior kind of thing. So once I've done that with more variables, I um, will get more and more of these terms in here. And there will be all of these individual observations showing up in a product. And of course, if I had n of these observations, then there would just be n of these terms in this product. Multiplied by a prior, normalized. And you can do the normalization in every single step, as I did in the demo, or we can do it at the end. Doesn't really matter. As long as we only start talking about probability distributions once they are normalized, everything's fine. So that was um, step number two. Step number one was, let's define our generative model. Step number two is now, let's think about the structure of this model a little bit to understand how expensive it's going to be to do the inference. Now, the third step is, so far, all of these are it's just abstract nonsense, right? I've just written down some symbols, but these functions don't actually have a shape yet. So then I ask you, so what is the probability for someone to wear glasses given that you've observed someone wear glasses, and we started thinking about the structure of the prior and the likelihood and actually assign values to them. Notice that what's happening there is that we are now in imposing our domain knowledge, or you could also say our assumptions, onto the model. So at this point, this is where the philosophical debate can start. Up until now, we've just done mathematics and everything is just axioms. Well, okay, you could, you could of course de debate the conditional independence as well. And I'm sure we will in the flipped classroom. So maybe that's part of the philosophy as well. But at some point, philosophy comes, or well, philosophy, yeah. At some point, our, our everyday knowledge or our mathematical assumptions about the process come in. And those are the ones that can be debated. Probability theory cannot be debated. It's just a set of axioms. The assumptions we make in a concrete experiment can be questioned. So I said the probability observed to observe someone to wear glasses given that they wear glasses, uh, sorry, no. <laughs> given the probability for someone to wear glasses given, um, no, the probability to observe someone wearing glasses given that the probability with to wear glasses is pi is pi and one minus pi the other way around. That's actually an assumption and you can think for yourself about whether you want to question this or not. And maybe we'll talk about it in the flipped classroom. And um, ah, yeah, so now for, for convenience, I will, let's introduce two new variables. You could call them random variables, um, but um, they are, they are things that we're going to know. So it doesn't matter so much that they are random. Uh, we will actually know how many observations we've made. Let's um, say um, we say capital N for the number of people with glasses we've seen and capital M for the number of people without glasses we, ha we have seen. And they take values little m and uh, little m. And um, we're going to use that to simplify our notation because after we've seen lots of observations, we don't want to plug in the individual terms. We want to somehow condense them. And we are allowed to do this because we've defined the notion of a random variable. So after having made n, uh, um, five observations, n of which were positive and m of which were negative, our posterior is going to have the following structure. There will be the prior that we haven't talked about yet, so we'll have to do that in a moment. In the demo, I did that first, but let's say we leave that to the end. And um, here, the likelihood will now take the form that there's only two kinds of terms in here. Either it was a positive, positive observation, then there's a pi in here, 
or it was a negative observation, then it's one minus pi in here. So we can get rid of the product symbol and instead write um, pi to the n times one minus pi to the n times the prior. That's what our posterior is going to be. And now we're left with only two problems. We have to define what the prior is and we have to get this normalization constant. So this is now where people who criticize probability theory might come, or Bayesianists might come in and say, oh, but now you're prior. The prior is the big problem, right? How are you going to deal with the prior? So here is how Laplace deals with the prior. It makes some uh, very interesting observation. So what we will need to do um, Bayesian inference is that we need to compute this um, normalization constant, right? We need to integrate over this function. Now, notice that, um, well, in the, in, the, in, the, in the experiment, I actually did a, did a simple thing. I said, uh, let's just say that prior is uniform. It's just one, right? Then um, we need to, in the end, solve an integral that is something like the integral over pi to the n times one minus pi to the n. Now, here's a super smart observation due to Laplace, which is, hmm, okay, so to solve this problem, I need to be able to solve such integrals. Now, notice that the unit function is actually also of this form. It's just pi to the zero times one minus pi, sorry, uh, pi to the one times one minus pi to the first power, right? Because then it's just pi times one minus pi. Uh, which is one. So, okay. Um, no, I'm sorry, that was wrong. Okay, short correction. It's just pi to the zero times one minus pi to the zero, which is one times one, which is one. Yeah, that's how this works. Okay, good. So, actually, since we will have to solve this integral, which actually was a huge problem for Laplace, let's talk about that in the flipped classroom, um, but since I have to solve this kind of integral anyway, I could actually consider any prior that is of this form. So any prior that can be written like this, where we've introduced a minus one for convenience. So then um, this is, uh, that's why I, why I was confused just now, right? So if you set uh, A and B to one, then you get our unit prior. Well, it looks like this, right? Um, because then if you have a prior that is of this form, then if you multiply it with the likelihood, we'll still have to solve an integral that is of this general form. So actually, we can be more general in our definition of a prior than using a uniform prior. We can, do, um, we, can, we can choose priors that are of this general form because then we have to still, before and after, always just have to integrate this kind of function. And this thing has a name, it's called the beta function. And Laplace actually couldn't do this integral. So when he did his computations, he actually used an approximation. And I think this is a fun thing to discuss in the third classroom, so we'll talk about that then. Um, this integral was solved by Leonard Euler a little bit after that class. So um, this is called the beta integral. And the, um, uh, so what this means is that we can think of a prior as arising from past observations. And if you use a uniform prior, that's a little bit like assuming that we have no prior observations. At least that was Laplace's argument, which is also maybe where this minus one comes from. He in fact actually writes that. So here he is again saying this. Um, oh yeah, it's in French again. Sorry, I can translate into German, uh, into English. So um, he's writing that. And again, keep in mind, it's 1814. This poor guy doesn't have access to proper mathematical notation yet. And all the concepts that we now use to simplify stuff, he doesn't even know what a random variable is. So he has to write this very complicated sentence. When the values of x considered independently of the observed result are not equally possible, if we name z the function of x, which expresses their probability, that's our prior, it's easy to see by what has been said in the first chapter of this book, so by what we've just done basically, that by changing in formula one, which is what I had on the previous slide, y in y times z, we will have the probability that the value of x is within the limits between pi and pi prime. This amounts to assuming all the values of x equally possible a priori and to considering the observed results as being, first by two, as being formed by two independent results whose probabilities are y and z. So he's saying to, um, we, we can actually consider a more complicated prior and then our data 
and think of the resulting posterior as, resu as resulting from two different data sets, some a priori observations multiplied with the, with the likelihood for the new observations that we collected. These a priori observations are today often called pseudo-observations. We can thus reduce Laplace writes all the cases to the one where we assume a priori before the event an equal possibility to the different values of x and by this reason we will adopt this hypothesis and what follows. So he says if you, th you already have some other prior knowledge then you can include that as if it were a data set rather than actually calling it a prior. This is called, this, this sort of algebraic structure we've used here has a name and I'm just going to um, tell you about it now um, and we will come back to it much later in the course. It's a really beautiful concept. What we've just done here is we've constructed something that's called a conjugate prior. Why have we done that? And this is often something people ask in the lecture. It's because it makes the computation easy. And of course, this might seem really fishy to you. Because if the point of probabilistic reasoning is to express everything we know and then do mechanical inference and then not never to question the mechanical process anymore, it seems a bit dodgy that we're doing this, uh, we're sort of fiddling with the prior to simplify this computation. And maybe it is. We should talk about that in the flipped classroom. Please come with your questions. However, there is, um, I mean, the simple answer is think for yourself about, or maybe try it out, with your machine, um, what kind of shapes of priors you can address by using this kind of prior distribution. So basically, change a and b, make a plot of this function, set a to anything from zero or just above zero to a large number and b, and see what kind of shapes you can create. And if you think that that's an interesting language in which to encode prior information, then you've already bought the argument. And if you think there are some kinds of priors that you can't encode with this, then think for yourself about what you can do today using your cool computer, which Labotta Plus couldn't do in 1814, to replace this prior with something else. Okay, with that, we're at the end. Let me briefly summarize. Random variables allow us to define derived quantities from atomic events. Borel sigma algebras can be defined on all topological spaces, allowing us to define probabilities if the elementary space is continuous, and probability density functions distribute probability across continuous domains. PDFs are actually the objects of interest for anything real valued or continuous valued because they satisfy the rules of probability. We can basically treat them as if they are probabilities. The only problem is that we, when we transform variables, in any way, in particular also in a nonlinear way, then they transform non-trivially and we have to be careful about these transformations. But as long as we don't transform our variables, everything's fine. That was the tedious mathematical part of this, uh, of this lecture. We had to do it, but now we have all of our tools available and we can start doing some actual computations with real numbers, actual experiment, and think about how we do this with computers and we don't have to follow in the footsteps of 1814 anymore. And I'm hoping we'll see each other again in lecture four. Thanks for your time.